Hi, my name is Anita Schoenberg, and I am currently a third year architecture student in Tom Fowler's studio, and I'll be one of your ISAs for ARC 131 this year. So in this tutorial, we're just going to talk about a few things. I'm going to start with layer organization, setting your line weights and line types, um, setting your print colors, and then I'm going to show you how, once you have your drawing all set up, how to lay it out on a page so that it's easy to print. After that, I'm just going to go over a few advanced drafting techniques, some commands that might come in handy as you move forward in drafting in Rhino. So I'm going to start out by going to the right side of my Rhino, and I'll see the a panel called layers pulled up. It's these two rectangles stacked on top of each other. If you don't see that, then you may need to go to the little settings and make sure you have your layers turned on. So layers can be used for a lot of things. They're usually for sorting information as your drawings start to get more complicated. In this sense, I'm going to use layers in order to organize my line weights. So I'm going to make three layers. I'm going to make a layer that's called dark, a layer that's called medium, and a layer that's called light. And I can change the name of these layers just by double clicking on the name tab. And in terms of line weights, usually what's closer to you is darker and what's further away is lighter. So that's what I'm, that's the technique I'm gonna to use to organize my line weights in this drawing that Chad and Erica had done last time. So in this scenario, the stand and this little piece of the lamp is in front. So I'm gonna make that my darkest line weight as it's closest to me. And you'll see that it turned red. That's because it's now on this red layer that I have labeled dark. And then I'm going to go back. And since the rest of the lamp is in further away from me, it's going to be a lighter line weight. I'm going to go ahead and put that in my medium layer. So you do that by right clicking, move objects to this layer. And you'll see that now it's purple. They're in my medium layer. And then a lot of times what I'll do for smaller details like this right here, oops, I moved it by accident, but like this right here, I'll put that into my lighter line weight because I don't want to draw too much attention to it by putting it in a heavy line weight, but I still want it to be there in my drawing. So I'm going to move that to a lighter line weight so it still has a presence, but it doesn't overpower. So this kind of um, breaks the rule of something being closer or being darker. And then I forgot to set this to my heavy line weight, so I'm going to make sure I move that there. So now I have all my um, lines categorized into groups. So now I'm going to go and set the line weights. You can do that by going to the print width. You'll see right now they're all set to default. So I'm going to change those to the line weights that I want. So maybe I'll set my darkest line weight at a 0.6. And then I'll set my medium line weight as a 0.5, and then I'll set my lightest line weight at a 0.35. And then these diamonds indicate what color it's going to print in. So right now they're set to the same color as the layers. So I'm going to go ahead and change that so they all print in black. And line weights kind of depend on the drawing and what you're doing. The numbers I set are definitely not a standard that you'll use for everything. So it kind of just depends on how much detail you have in the drawing, what your professors recommend. So this is based on more of a drawing basis, but I put these in for now. And when we go to print, we can check our line weights and make sure everything reads well. And if it doesn't read well, then we can go back and change our line weights as well. So now that I have my line weights set and my colors set, I'm gonna go to lay it out on my page. But before I do that, I just wanna show you one more thing in case you need it for the future. In this tab right here, you'll see line type. Right now, all my lines are set to continuous, which means they're all going to be solid continuous lines. But say that I needed to have a dash line in my drawing at some point. Well, if I want all the lines I have on my purple layer to be dashed, I can just go right here and select the dashed option. And now you'll see that they appear as dashed lines. So this is just for future reference if you may need to use that. So now when I go to print, you'll know that we drew our drawing at a one-to-one -one scale, which means that if I draw an 11 by 17 rectangle, that will be the size of my page. And since we're printing at a one-to-one -one scale, I can just use that as my quote-unquote paper. So I'm going to draw a rectangle that's 11 by 17. I'm 
I'm going to rotate this it's landscape. And then I'm just going to place it within. And then when we go to print, we can use this rectangle as a base for our drawing um, for our paper. So we can set this as our window. And then when we go to print, everything will be set up within this page just the way we like it. So add my name in the corner. You can do that by typing in text. you may need here. And then I just drag and drop that in the corner. And then if I had a couple different viewports here, say I had a plan view, an elevation view, then I could just lay them all out on my sheet. And once I'm happy with the way it's laid out, I can type in the command print so that it's ready to print. The first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that my page size is set to an 11 by 17. There's a bunch of default options. If you don't see an 11 by 17, you can go to manage custom sizes and then set your dimensions yourself. And then if you look at the preview, you're gonna see that my lamp is not showing up here and that's because my window is not set to the right spot. So I'm gonna click set window. And since we already drew an 11 by 17 rectangle, I can use that as a base for my paper. There we go. Now you'll see that my lamp um, and my paper fit within that boundary I set earlier. And then you're gonna make sure that you're at a one-to-one -one scale since that's what we're using for this drawing. In the future, you may use different scales such as one half inch equals one foot, one fourth inch equals one foot. But since we're using one-to-one -one for this situation, I'm just gonna leave it at that. And then I usually use a vector output for line weight. I think that shows line weight the best, but sometimes it depends on your rhino. Some rhinos are a little funky with it. So you may have to experiment between vector and raster output. So once everything's all set up, I'm gonna go ahead and do open in preview or I'll save it as a PDF to see if I like the line weights. So I just pulled up the PDF that I just saved and you can see that there's a little differentiation between line weights now. This light layer is lighter than this dark layer I have here, but I still feel like there's not enough differentiation between my dark and medium layer. So I'm gonna go back into Rhino and change my line weight so that it reads the way I want it to read. So now I have it pulled up with my refined line weights. I think this reads a little better because now you can see a little more differentiation between my darker line weight and my medium line weight. So it helps read what's closer and what's further away a little better. And I think now that I'm happy with this, I'm just gonna save it. And if I were to print, I could just go ahead and print right here. So now I'm just gonna go through some commands that may be helpful as you continue drafting in Rhino. I'll share this Rhino file with AJ, so if you guys wanna follow along, then you can go ahead and do that. So I'm just gonna go through and show you a few commands that may be helpful as you continue exploring Rhino. So the first command is offset. You'll find that a lot of commands in Rhino are relatively self-explanatory. Offset will just offset a line a certain direction and distance. So if I go here and I change distance, let's say I wanna offset it 0.25 inches, I can type that in and you'll see it change the distance and I can offset it to either side. I can do the same thing with curves or circles. So if I were to offset to the outside, I can keep doing that. I can also do it with my circle. And I can change its distance as I wish. That's a big circle. <laughs> There we go. The next command is ray. So if I have one line and I wanna have a group of lines that are equally spaced, I can type in array. And I can either type in the number I want. So if I want six in the X direction, I'll just keep six. In the Y and Z direction, you can't type in zero just because of Rhino's um, defaults. So we're just gonna leave it at one. And then I'm gonna click my first point for when I want it to start and then my second point for how far I want to space them. And you'll see that now I have six equally spaced lines. You can also use array um, and type in the distance. 
So if I want them to be spaced 0.3 inches apart, I can type in 0.3, and now you'll see that I have six lines that are 0.3 inches apart. The next command is orient. So say I have this rectangle that's at an angle and I want to orient it to my square. I'll just type in orient. It will ask me to choose two reference points and these reference points will, are what will be used to line things up. So I have one and two and then I'm going to do one and two here and now you'll see that it is lined up. The next command is interp curve. This is helpful if you're tracing something or you're trying to get more of a curve that doesn't follow a circle. Uh, this may help in some of the details in your drawings, but it works by you plotting points and then it will draw the curve between the points. Next I have trim. So say I want to make this a sharp corner. I don't want this line sticking out. I can type in trim. It'll ask me for my cutting object and then it will ask me what I want to trim. So I'm going to trim this top part off. And then I can do the same thing with the circle. Say I don't want these two lines sticking outside the circle. I'm going to type in trim, click on my circle, and then trim that off. I can do the same thing kind of in the opposite direction. So say I want to have my line extend to this line. I can type in extend. It will ask for my boundary object. And then I can select the curve I want to extend. So now you can see that this line is now touching my vertical line. And I can do the same thing here. If I want this line to touch the edge of the circle, I can type in extend, click on my boundary object, and then extend the curve to that edge. I can also use group. This may come in handy if you have a bunch of different lines and you just want to group them together for a second to organize your drawing a little bit. You can type in group, select the objects that you want to group, and you'll see that now it took it from two pieces to one whole. So again, I have two pieces here. I want to group them into one object. Select them, type in group. Now I have one object. Now if you have a grouped item like these two here and you want to ungroup them, you can just type in ungroup and then it'll take your objects that are grouped together and ungroup them into separate objects again. I'm going to do the same thing here. You can see they're two separate objects now. Another command that may be useful is fillet or fillet. I honestly don't know what's the right pronunci pronunciation. Um, people make fun of me for both, so we're just going to go for it. So you type in the command and then you can set a radius. That's the radius that this curve is going to turn into from this angle. And then I'm just going to keep that at a 0.5 inch radius. Then you're going to select your first curve, select your second curve, and you'll see it turned that into a um, curved corner. And I can do the same thing with a chamfer. A chamfer pretty much takes this angle and draws a line. Um, so I can show you that, chamfer. And then select your first curve, select your second curve, and you'll see now I have a line between the two instead of a sharp corner. And fun fact, all the columns in building five have chamfered edges. Another useful command is scale. So say I want to scale this square down to a smaller size. I can set my reference points in scale. I can also type in a scale option. So if I want to scale it by two, select my base point, and then I can just type in two. So now it's scaled it by two. And I can do that with any shape. So with my circle, I can scale it down and I can scale it up. So scale works in two dimensions, but if you want to scale it in one dimension, you can do that as well. It's just not going to keep your proportions. So I can type in scale 1D, which means one dimension. And now I can turn my square into a rectangle. I can turn my rectangle into an even skinnier square, um, I mean rectangle. So this can also be useful. Another useful command is divide. So I have this line and I want to divide it into five equal segments. Well, instead of measuring it out and drawing my lines in, I can just type in the command divide. 
And then let's say I want to break it into five even segments. I can press enter. And now you'll see that it broke my line up into five even segments with these points. I can do the same thing, but with a distance. So if I want to divide, but I don't know how many pieces I want to divide it in, but I know how far apart I want them to be, I can click on length. And then I can type in the length. So I'm going to have them divide into one inch segments. And now you'll see it broke my line up into one inch segments. And I can do the same thing with my circle as well. Another command is split. So I have this square, but let's say I want to split it in half with this line. I can type in the command split. I can select the object I want to split and then select my cutting object. And now my square is broken into two pieces by that line. I can also do it with my circle. So I have my circle, but I want to split it with this line. I can type in the command split select the object, select the cutting objects, and now I have my circle broken into two pieces. Now if I have lines that are not, oops, if I have lines that are not connected, but I want them to be connected, so say I split my square, but now I want it to be one continuous line again, I can click on both the lines and type in join. So you'll see that it took it from two lines back into one. And I can do the same with my circle. And if any of you all have your drawings and your lines are broken up into multiple pieces, you can type in join and it will make it one continuous line again. You can also use the hide and show command. So say I want to focus on just this square right now, but this line is getting in the way and I just want to hide it. I can type in hide and it will temporarily hide the line for me. It's still in Rhino, it's just not appearing at the moment. And then I can type in show to make it reappear. And I can do the same thing with the circle. Say I want to get rid of this line. I can type in hide. Gets rid of the line. Type in show. And now it reappears. Copy is another useful command. You can type in copy and then select a point and then copy from that point and continue copying your object. You can also do it with multiple objects. So say I have this square and circle and I want to copy them. I can just keep copying. You can also set a distance for copies. So if you want to copy at a certain distance, you can type that in. I also have move. So say I want to move this circle into my square. I can type in move, select a point on the circle, select a point on the square, and now they're within each other. You can also just move it arbitrarily, so like that. Isolate and show are also helpful ones. They're kind of similar to hide and show. So say I just want to see the square. I don't want to see anything else in my Rhino space. And I can type in isolate and it will temporarily hide everything else. And then if I type in show, they'll reappear. And ZS is another helpful one. So say I'm zoomed out all the way. I see this little circle. I want to zoom in on it. I can type in ZS and then it will zoom into that circle. So if I'm zoomed out and, oh, I want to zoom it into ungroup, then I can type in ZS and it will zoom into that. So I hope this was helpful. As I said earlier, a lot of the Rhino commands are relatively self-explanatory. And another helpful way to explore and gain experience with Rhino is just to read the prompts that Rhino gives you. So like I said earlier, when I typed in offset, it asked me the distance I want to offset, if I want the corner to be sharp or round. Um, experimenting with these options will help you learn a little bit more about Rhino and it will kind of guide you in using these commands. So now I'm going to pass it along to Victor and he's going to talk a little more and show you all an example. Hi everyone, my name is Victor and I'm another one of your eyes saves this year. In this tutorial, we'll be reviewing orthogonal projections and a six view standard drawing arrangement in order for you to lay them out to print. Then I'll be showing how you can draft oblique projections for your found objects in a later portion of this video too. So to begin with, I'll be picking up from where Chad and Erica left off in last Thursday's tutorial on drafting 
the elevation of the lamp that we're using from this example, which we'll consider as the front view of the six drawings that we're reintroducing to. So taking the information that's already provided in this drawing, I'll be using this to go ahead and make the top view of the lamp by translating construction lines and using measurements from the top view in order to make the top view drawing. So to begin with, I'll start by making construction lines that extend from the width of the entire lamp to an arbitrary length, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then I'll be using several commands that were introduced to you in, last, in the last tutorial, including circle, mirror, rectangle, um, et cetera, and various other commands for that matter, um, in order to draft the top view of this lamp too. And so you see that I switched from the construction line layer to the chat layer in order to first visually differentiate the two different lines that I'm trying to draw with in Rhino, and also to make it easier for myself in the future when I'm going to print this drawing um, with the different line layers uh, that I'm trying to print too. So then we'll go ahead and make the thickness of this uh, lamp, which for this tutorial, I'll just assume that it's uh, 0 0.025 inches. Um, but for your projects, just make sure to measure every single dimension and to make sure that everything's accurate too. And then I'll just go ahead and make the light bulb itself, which again, I'll assume is uh, 1.5 inches. And then I'll go back into the front view and then construct construction lines in order to make the light posts itself on either side, as you can see here, here, and also here. So by extending these construction lines, um, I'm making sure that everything first lines up. And also I'm making sure to not do double work in Rhino by typing in multiple of the same uh, dimensions like this diameter and this um, length. Uh, so that everything just goes easier in Rhino for me and just goes smoothly too. So then I'll go back to the chat layer and then make the post itself which I'll assume is about an eighth of an inch. And then I'll just move this to the very bottom of the light bulb or the lamp. And then I'll just mirror this on the other side of the lamp itself too. And then essentially this just completes the top view of this lamp already too. And you see that it's relatively accurate to the reference image. And then if I turn off the construction line there, it is more clear in how it is resembled too. And so I'll just skip ahead into completing the six different uh, views. And then I'll just go ahead and talk about the uh, printing techniques. So once you finish drawing all six of your drawings, uh, you want to make sure to lay them out in this same manner. You're referencing back to the unfolding box technique that was handed out to you in your orthogonal projections handout last week, so that your top lies in the top, your bottom lies in the bottom of the front, and then the right is on the right side of the front, and the left is the left, and then the back is the furthest to the left. Um, in this manner, because First, your viewer can very easily and very quickly understand what your drawing is talking about and what you're referencing to. And it also shows that everything first lines up and also everything is all related to your drawing altogether too. So for instance, this front view is built to the top view, the right view, the bottom, left, and back accordingly, right? And so once you lay your, your, your drawings out in this manner, um, you want to just, you want to go ahead and adjust the construction lines, right? Um, and this is a concept that Anita introduced in part one of this tutorial, 
Um, and so we'll just quickly go ahead and adjust the line weights for construction lines by going into the print width tab and then going to the default and adjusting the line weight widths into different widths, as you can see in this toggle down and scroll down menu. And we'll just adjust into a hairline because um, construction lines are essentially the very thin, the most thin line that would, uh, that would show up when you're drawing because there are essentially guides for um, the overall object itself. And then we'll go ahead and change this into dark gray or gray. Um, and that will allow you to color your drawing accordingly when you go ahead and print later too by changing this menu. And then it's also important to note that there are different types of line weight hierarchies. And so instead of going around and changing all the line weights here, um, and this is something that Anita mentioned in her video too, um, but for the purposes of this part of the tutorial, I'll just pause on the line weights uh, because uh, there are different standards and different ways of differentiating between line weights and the hierarchies. And so um, I'll just leave that to your professors to explain to you uh, what kind of line weight you want to use for your specific drawing and how you want to present that into your final drawing and print. So once you finish uh, adjusting the line weight layers, you want to make sure that you're going to go ahead and print accordingly too. And so I'll just make a new layer and label it as printing. And then I'll just make this into, let's say, a blue layer to make sure that I'm not uh, mistaking this as Chad or any other layer. And then I'll also make sure to make this into a no print line weight so that you're not printing the boundary box by accident. And I'll just make um, an 11 by 17 boundary box. As such. I'll then just rotate this 90 degrees and then try to fit this into the drawings that I have. And so, Again, this will be different for your own projects because the line, the, the length that we chose um, is rather large. And so for the purposes of this tutorial, it won't fit into the printing box. Although for your drawings, it will be small enough to fit all of your views into this one drawing too, or this one paper size too. And if you want to adjust them, you can always adjust them as such, right? So that you can at least try to put in, let's say, three drawings all together, right? Um, but you want to make sure that your paper covers all of your drawings, and then make sure when you go ahead and print, um, as Anita mentioned in part one of this video, that everything is scaled to one-to-one, -to -one, everything is uh, set to black and white, and et cetera, and make sure to uh, make everything neat for printing, essentially. So in this next part of the tutorial, we'll be working on how to draft an oblique projection of your found object. And to begin to understand what this might entail and what process you might be doing for Rhino in order to make this oblique projection, we'll begin with this imaginary six by six cube for this example. And specifically, we'll be interested in the front and the left views of this imaginary six by six cube, right? And so if you imagine a six by six cube in the front and left view, you'll be left with this 2D six by six box, right? Because in a cube, all the side lengths are uh, the same side lengths on every single side, right? And so let's say you wanted to make a front oblique projection, right? And so um, in order to visualize what this might mean, we'll be interested in looking at this in the left view, right? This elevation view of this front view, right? And so in order to make this front oblique projection, what you're essentially doing is that you're viewing the cube in, in a very head-on view, just like the front view, although you'll be also looking at a portion of the top, right? And so what this means is that you'll be looking at this cube at some sort of angle, now you can see the front and the top. 
that's some angle that you define called theta for your oblique, right? And so in the end, you'll be left with this kind of drawing where you preserve the entire front, right? Just like in this front view, but you'll see that you see this very skewed top, right? In a cube, all the sides are the same length, right? Although, although the front is preserved in all the dimensions, the top view is the one that is skewing um, or is presented in a skewed manner, right? So in order to work in this drawing, right, we'll first be interested in the front uh, oblique projection, right? And so you want to copy this front view and rotate it at some random angle. Let's say uh, you wanted to make a 23 degree projection or 23 oblique of the front view, right? And so you'll notice that um, this square, this front view was rotated about the center of the entire square, right? And so what this means is that uh, your angle, your 23 degree angle that you define is relative to this horizon, right? Because this angle is greater than this angle. And because it's a 23 acute angle, this angle has to be your um, rotated angle, right? And so it's important to note that this is a side that you rotated at. It's because um, we'll be using this side as a reference for your construction lines, right? And so as you continue to make this oblique projection, we'll work with the construction lines by taking the corners of this rotated uh, portion of the square relative to the horizon line, right? And drawing construction lines on either end of this line, right? And then you also make a third line that matches the rotated side of this square, this cube. Um, and then we'll move this at some arbitrary length, um, pulling down from the cube. And then you'll pull construction lines towards the left in order for you to line them up with the front of the drawing because you're gonna make the front oblique projection, right? And so you'll draw construction lines from the entire width of this front view. And then to finish this drawing, you'll be taking the front, you'll be completing the box that's defined by these construction lines and make sure that everything is accurate and snaps to all the points that you're defining here, right? And then you could take this box and then copy it to this bottom so it matches. And then what you're left with is, um, if I turn off this construction layer, you'll be left with this front preserved view, but you'll have this um, skewed top view, just like this uh, visualized example that we just talked about before. In the beginning of this portion, you'll have the front uh, preserved, but a skewed top portion, right? And so if you apply this into the lamp that we've been working on since last week and this week for these two tutorials, you see that the front view of the lamp is rotated, in this case, 30 degrees about the horizontal axis this way. And then it's translated with construction lines downwards and to the left. And then if I remove these construction lines, you will able to see that if you draw a tangent line right at the image plane where the front view um, exists with the edge of this rounded piece of the circular lamp, you see that the front uh, preserves the entire dimensions of the front view here. And then everything is uh, oblique in a 30 degree way and that views it from a top down angle view of 30 degrees. So I hope this tutorial helps you in drafting an oblique projection of your uh, object. 
And I hope to help you soon and see you soon in office hours and anywhere else during studio throughout this year too. Thank you.